Good morning, everyone. Forgot to put my giant microphone where it belongs. Ugh. For some reason, the cord's not reaching. That's not good. It's Monday, so you know we're a little bit late, we're a little bit frazzled, but that's okay. We're happy to be here. I want to thank all of you for being here. Let's make sure I can see all of the uh, YouTube comments. All right, I think we've successfully done this. Maybe, maybe not. For some reason, my setup's not right today. I don't, I don't exactly know what the problem is, but everything is kind of, um, kind of on top of each other. Just got back yesterday from uh, Foxwoods. That was a lot of fun. I went there, played a um, $1,700 tournament two times. First time, I started with 25,000 chips, got up to um, 80,000, which is a pretty, pretty nice stack. But then I lost every hand. I got it all. I, I three bat jacks. My opponent called. It came jack eight, three, like all clubs. It's pretty happy. Um, went bet, bet, or bet, flop, jam, turn. He had ace, nine of clubs. So that was unfortunate. Then I um, lost a flip with jacks. Someone jammed for like 12 big blinds. Someone called. I re-raised. The caller in the middle folded. I got it in against ace-king and lost. I actually flopped a set of jacks on that one too. Not that that matters. When you're all in, it doesn't really matter if you flop the set because the card, you're already all in. Then lost some other hands. don't exactly remember what happened. But I lost all my hands. It was funny. I went from like chip leader at the table to out in about an hour just by losing every big pot. And that's okay. Sometimes you're going to lose. Um, then, on my second entry, didn't really win many hands either. I did, um, what ended up happening is there was a 20 big blind. I had 20 big blinds eventually. The blinds were already high. Someone raised, I jammed ace jack, he called. I was against ace king and I lost. I was down to one big blind. I turned it into 10. It feels like a mild miracle to turn one into 10. Then, um, cut off raise, I jammed uh, queen jack. For 10 big blinds, he called a 10-9, and I was out the door. So that was fun. And um, then after that, I played some 2-5 cash games. That was basically the biggest no-limit game they had running during the morning, during the day. And that was fun. So today, I wanted to talk a little bit about the 2-5 session. I didn't play too incredibly long, but I did see a lot of interesting things that I think are worth noting. So we'll talk about cash game tips. Also, tonight... I'm hosting a completely free webinar for all of you. We will be going through five cash game tips, different ones than we talk about today. And um, you can find a link for it at twitter.com slash Jonathan Little. There'll be uh, a pinned post there. You can just click the link. It'll take you right there to the webinar. So check that out. Let's see. Dilly says, this weekend you played 21 hours of 1-2. After travel rake, you walked away up $600. Now you're going to sign up for Poker Coaching Premium. Good. <laughs> Hope you enjoy it. I'm glad that you had a very solid winning session. It's always nice just to have good, solid winning sessions. It's nice when things go well. Um, how do you battle fatigue in a long tournament? Uh, make sure you're in good shape. And that way you don't get tired. I really don't get all that tired. I think this is an issue for older players um, in general or players who are generally in bad shape. If you're in bad shape physically... Um, you're going to find that you get worn down. And also, you need to make sure that you understand poker well. That way, the decisions are not strenuous, right? A lot of people get in their minds, and, and, and to, you know, rightfully so, that they are in there battling. They're having a hard time. You have to just be okay with that, right? You're buying a car today. Any tips? Try to get a good price. You can save a decent amount of money buying a car if you're just willing to negotiate and walk away and not have to buy it today. Let's see, if you had, do you have a problem getting on the webinar the other day? That is just you. Try a different device, reload the, the program, et cetera, et cetera. Good morning from Newfoundland. Hello, hello. You have much more success in cash games than you do in tournaments. You seem to struggle with tournaments and you're not afraid of getting a decent, if you're not getting a decent run of hands. Well, Mark, you have to understand you should struggle more in tournaments because you don't win in tournaments very often. You have to ask yourself, Mark, how many tournaments have you really played? If the answer is not, 200, 300, like you really should not have expected to have any decent runs by them, especially if you're playing tournaments that have 100 or 200 or 500 people. So there's just way, way, way more variance in tournaments, and you have to understand and accept that. All right, all right, all right, all right. What time tonight? 8 p.m. Eastern time. I will see you all there. Um, so yeah, cash game tips. So I showed up to the cash game table, 
And it was very clear to me that people were playing loose, splashy poker. And first things first, at um, Foxwoods, they take $5 rake. This is a 2-5. I don't know what they do at the other tables. They take $5 rake, and then there's a $1 bad beat jackpot drop as well. So it's basically $6 rake at the most. Not always, but usually. I believe it was a 10% rake. So if there's like a raise and a call for $20 preflop, the pot's already $40. They take $4 preflop, right? Right off the bat. And that's high. So I say that's high. That's normal nowadays. It used to be high. Back in the day, you all may not know this. The rake would stop at $3. $3 was the maximum they took whenever I was first starting to play poker. Um, you can still play some time games where they take like 6 or $7 um, per half hour, which is way better than, than a rakes game for you. But, you know, casinos want to make money, so they're going to rake you as much as the people will tolerate. So the first thing you have to understand is you need to play a little bit tight, a little bit aggressive. Because whenever you raise preflop and everybody folds, you don't pay the rake. And also, you make the pot bigger, and as the pot gets bigger, the rake becomes less, right? Very impressed by the pronunciation attempt of Newfoundland. Newfoundland. Yeah, I, I, Newfoundland, I don't know how to say these words. I'm a silly American, I just do my best. Um... So yeah, you need to understand that you need to play a little bit tight, a little bit aggressive, because then the rake is minimal. And also, you have a bigger edge in the pots that you play, right? And just do a little bit of math here real quick. Let's say you play... Um, let's say you're playing 20 hands per hour. Like you're in there, and you win like 52% of them on average. And each hand is, I don't know, $25, $50, I don't know. Do some math. You're going to find that if you play a lot of hands, the rake just takes all of your profit. The way you beat these games is to play relatively tight, get it in like 60 or 65% equity in these hands, make the pot bigger, and then you pay the same $5 or $6 rake. So if you pay way less rake, that will completely mitigate whatever edge the house has on you to some extent. And um, also you'll generally just have fewer swings because you have a bigger edge. Um, also, you really just can't play every hand. That's basically it. I've I've talked to a few owners of home games and who rake a lot, and nobody wins in those games besides people who play really, really tight. And I'm not going to say you have to play really, really tight, but you do need to play reasonably tight. And the $6 rake, I want to make it clear, it's not egregious. As some of you are saying, $3 max rake. Last weekend, you played a game you got in preflop. They took 13 Yeah. Uh, the, like I said, the casinos will take legitimately as much as you, as you the players, will tolerate. If all the players stop playing, then uh, they'll have to adjust. But people keep playing. So they don't care. They'll keep raising the rake as long as you keep playing, right? So what do you do? Well, you stop playing in places where the rake is high. For example, in New York City, in private games here, they take $50 uncapped, or $50 rake. Like five, They'll do 5% uncapped or 5% capped at $50 or something like that. Um, a lot of the higher stakes games is just uncapped 5%. So, yeah, good luck beating that. I mean, think about playing 25.50, right? Say there's a 25.50 raise and a call for $150 total. That makes the pot $300, okay? What's 5% of 300? $15. They take $15 on a preflop raise and a call. And then, say you get it all in for $10,000 total. $5,000 each, just 100 big blinds, nothing insane. Well, they're raking $500. So, um... Clearly, you're not going to be beating this game. Unless your opponents are really bad or you play really tightly and you don't pay the rake all that much. They like playing PLO, too. In PLO, you get it in more often, which is really good for the casino, right? And um, you get it all in more often with a lower edge, usually. And then they just, like, say you get in with 55% equity across the board, but they take 5% rake. They just raked away all your profits, which is not why no one wins. How do you approach a cash game with no max buy-in? I discussed this thoroughly in my book, Jonathan Little on Live No Limit Cash Games. Where is that? Here it is. Jonathan Little on live No Limit Cash Games. I discuss exactly this. I discuss how much you should buy in for. And it depends a ton on what the other stack sizes are at the table. If the players on your left are all deep stack and the players on your right are shallow, you should be shallow almost every time. If the players on your right are deep, the players on your left are shallow. You should be deep almost every time. If the players are, if the only players who are good are the deep stack players 
and the short side players are bad, you need to be short, right? You don't have, need to have an ego problem just think, oh, I'm going to buy in for the maximum. How do you get over Monsters Under the Bed Syndrome when playing cash games? Re understand ranges better, right? If you thoroughly understand ranges, you'll realize your opponents just don't have the nuts all that often. Let's see. A lot of you are saying, yeah, the $6 rake isn't even all that bad. You have to understand that just because something is not all that bad does not mean it's not egregious and awful, right? Like, um, compared to McDonald's, I'm sure, um, I don't know, name another hamburger place. A slightly more healthy hamburger place isn't all that bad, but it's probably still awful for you, right? And realize you have options. You do actually have options. How much do you tip the dealer if you win the high hand jackpot? I don't know. I've never won a high hand jackpot. I don't typically play in games with a high hand jackpot all that often. If you do, then um, I don't know if you're supposed to tip the dealer. I'm sure they expect you to be tipped. I remember a long time ago, I was um, doing this diamond in a day thing to get a diamond card at Harris so we could skip lines. Back in the day, I had to wait in lines to register for tournaments, and I really didn't like waiting in lines. So you basically pay Harris like $1,000 in expected loss to not have to wait in lines, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, I'd be playing like $25 hand video poker, and every time you get quads, the payout was more than $3,000. And the person would come over and have to like hand pay it out and give you a tax form. And then they would just be like wanting you to tip them. It's like you realize, I'm down. I'm going to be losing on this day, right? And uh, it's kind of silly to think that you should tip the dealer or the person who brings you the money or whatever because they dealt the lucky hand, you know? Like think about how illogical that is. Think about how completely logical that is. Um, as for tips at a game where they do rake high amount, like a dollar is plenty. You just have to accept that that's, that's plenty. Sorry for the dealers. Uh, you're, the place you work rakes way too much money. It's not, Which sucks, actually, for the dealers. Um, if, like, I mean, back in the day, I'd be tipping like $5 a hand, playing 5, 10, and 10, 20, whenever they rake $3 a hand. It's like not a big deal, right? And... Um, it's a bit unfortunate that the casinos have decided to gouge the players. How much does this book cost? MSRP is 34 bucks. I bet you can find it cheaper on Amazon.com. Go to JonathanLittlePoker.com slash books. You can find all of my books. Um, and they have affiliate links. So if you click and you buy through, through there, then um, Amazon will throw me a few bucks. What is happening on Facebook today? Facebook comments are not displaying properly. I wonder why. Well, we'll see. Anyway, this is a very good book if you are looking to play live cash games. Can you speak out the difference between 100 big blinds and 300 big blind games? Yes. When the opponents have comparable stacks, what are some major different plays? I mean, basically, you just want to play hands that are more nut-heavy, right? Or hands that can make the nuts more often. And um, that's going to mean big card offsuit hands go down in value, right? The suited connected hands generally go up in value. The um, suited aces go up in value, stuff like that. Alicia somehow took what I just said, so you don't tip the dealers? If you listen to exactly what I just said, I say I tip a dollar every hand that I win. Sometimes a little bit more if it's a gigantic pot, but um, I'm not sure how you could possibly have taken that I don't tip dealers out of me saying I tip a dollar every hand. Maybe a dollar every hand is nothing to you. Maybe that's it. It's $15 for that book on Kindle. There you go. What's a comfortable, effective starting stack for 2-5? It depends on what you are playing and who you're against, right? I mean, I, I'm telling you, get this book, Jonathan Little on Live No Limit Cash Games. I very clearly explain exactly my buy-in strategy. I'll tell you what page it's on. Let's see. Um, well, I'm not going to tell you what page it's on. I need to have a better better table of contents because it's not actually all that big of a section explaining, explaining what to do. Bankroll Management, page 245, 12-page section. Yep, I'm sure it's right in there. Very important. Very, very, very important. How much to take to the table? There you go, page 247. But yeah, a lot of people get it, it really is only like a page long. The idea that people just always buy a maximum or always buy in for 100 or always buy in for 40 is ridiculous. Kevin says, you always tip the dealer every hand, so if you want the high-end jackpot, you tip the same dollar. <laughs> I'd probably tip more than a dollar. But again, like there's really no purpose, right? Let's see. At live cash games, you're worried about how to know when to quit. Um, 
how do you know when to quit? You quit whenever you are no longer profitable or you have better things to do or you're tired or something like that. What I would do, and I used to be like essentially a professional cash game player, go to Bellagio every day and play 5, 10, or 10, 20, or bigger games if they were good. Um, I would essentially show up at noon, stay till midnight. I'd do it all day, every day. That's what I would do. And uh, that was nice. Make about a $1,000-ish a day, and it's a nice little grind. And I didn't mind it. Nice, easy, $1,000 day grind. So if your home game has 5% rate capped at 50 at 5, 10, are you saying that's unbeatable? I'm saying that's going to be a tough game to beat. That's for sure. 50 is a lot. 50 is a lot. Really appreciate what you're doing. Good. I'm glad you enjoy it. I'm glad that you all are here. I'm glad that you appreciate the work that I do for all of you. Also, we're having a webinar tonight for all those who are joining late. We will be going through five cash game tips. You can find the link for that at twitter.com slash Jonathan Little right at the top. You shouldn't be in games with a high hand jackpot, LOL. That is true. However, however, the high hand jackpot is not something you can opt out of in a lot of games or in a lot of places. I remember um, at, at some casinos that had high hand jackpot, they would let you opt out. Like I think Borgata would let you opt out. Like not you, like the whole table. The whole table could opt out of high hand jackpot. And then uh, they just have like a little plaque that said not a jackpot game. So that would be great. What are signs of cheating or collusion live? Cheating and collusion are essentially, well, collusion is essentially irrelevant in no limit cash games. The edge you can gain is very minimal. Um, cheating, if people are actually cheating in a casino, well then uh, they are very much in, at risk to go to jail. Let's see. Which friend did I go to Fox was with, with, with? We'll keep him anonymous for now. A well-known individual. Any caches? No. We both played twice. We both lost right at the end of the day. Um, James, what does the copy button do? James, send me an email with any questions about the range analyzer because I am certainly not a range analyzer pro. You plan to play the Ocean's Eleven World Series event? Look, I very rarely will I go play a World Series circuit event because the buy-ins are low, right? I only went to Foxwoods because one of my friends wanted to go for the day and because it's close and relatively cheap to get to. And um, that was fine. Why shouldn't you play the game that has the high-end jackpot? Because they take rake. You have to pay for it every time you do. And also, you, as a good player, are less likely to hit the high-end jackpot than a bad player because bad players play all the suited connectors and whatnot. If you play in a game where the limit hold, they have limit hold them and no limit hold them and they share the pool, which used to happen, I don't know if it does anymore. Um, limit hold them players hit the jackpot way more than no limit players because limit gets to the showdown way more often, right? So basically if you're a good player, you don't want the jackpot because you just don't play as many speculative hands. And if you are a no limit player and they combine it with limit, you really don't want it because you don't get to see near as many showdowns. Am I going to the UK anytime soon? Nope. My next trip is to Borgata and on, um, in about a few weeks. Then I'm going to Jacksonville. They have a World Poker Tour tournament there. I'll be at Bounty, so come say hi. Then we are going to the Bahamas in November. So that's it. All right, so let's talk about a few things that people are doing wrong in this game. First things first, uh, people are limping way too much. It would go limp, 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 and then... Um, they see the flop, and then the house would take four or five dollars right off the top, and that would be that, and that was unfortunate. Um, it's like right there, you just lose a lot of the pot. Also, they were limping with just jump, like they have ace four offsuit in middle position, they're just limping. So what do you do again about this? Well, you can limp behind a little bit more than you normally would. You could also raise more often over the limpers. There was one hand where I had jack six suited. It went limp, 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 and I was in the small blind, and I made it like $45 and I'd rather just fold it, right? That's the spot where if they were limping a more balanced range or just a better range, then you can't raise the junk from out of position. I actually discussed this in, I'm sure I discussed it in this book or one of the other cash game books I have. Is this book new? No, this book uh, was published four or five years ago, but still very, very, very relevant. That's the nice thing about a lot of my work is it stays pretty relevant. I mean, some stuff gets a little bit outdated because you know everything gets outdated over the course of many years, but Turns out it's, it's it's done pretty well, shockingly well, given all the other old books are just awful. Like a lot of, if you read a lot of old other people's old poker books, 
They are advocating such a weak, nitty form of poker that it's like if, if you're winning, it's minimal. And, or, I mean, I guess you can beat, beat opponents who are terrible, but people aren't terrible anymore, right? You have to learn to play against people who are decent. Um, so anyway, yeah, people are limping way too much. So you can raise with blockers and hands that have a little bit of equity but aren't quite good enough to call or at the bottom of the range. Um, so that's relevant. Also, you can just raise them in position. This is a spot where I will make bigger raises. Very exploitative strategy. It's like super obvious, but you bury it's bigger with your junk and smaller with your nuts because they'll call smaller raises. They'll fold to the bigger raises. Um, something I did notice uh, twice, actually. Someone would raise to 15. Someone would call. Someone yet to act would then re-raise to 40. Very small, right? 25 more. And two times, that $40 raise got through. Like, they just all folded for 25 more. And I was like, huh? What are they doing? Why would they possibly put in 15 as a preflop raiser from middle or early position and then fold for 25 more? I don't know, but that's what people are doing. So definitely keep that in mind. What do I think about Theory of Poker? That is a great book for learning how to play games that no longer exist and to learn the basics about games that no longer exist. So that's what you want to do with your time. Feel free. I can guarantee you there are way more applicable things to do, especially if you are a no limit hold'em player. You have to understand, back in the day, there was like no good poker content, no good educational content, and stuff like Theory of Poker was better than the alternatives, which is why it, got, it became a very popular book. It still sells well today, right? And just because something was good 25 years ago does not mean it is good, relevant, applicable today. Um, going back through my first, my first book, Secrets of Professional Tournament Poker, um, it's almost 10 years old. We may, may do an update. We'll see. But basically, there were like six or eight things that I thought were a little bit a little bit too aggressive, essentially. Like, say I'd say there's, say there's a raise and a call, I would do a lot of squeezing all in, with like 20 big blinds. And, you know, that's, it's fine if the opponents are too tight, but they're not too tight anymore. Like, they know to call off more. Um, so anyway, like, I found stuff in that book that are, that is, like, applicable, but also probably a bit too aggressive. So that's relevant. Also, I didn't necessarily know why I was making the plays that I make. But now I know why, because we have solvers. You can study all that, study the GTO. So uh, yeah, you learn to get better, essentially. Are you playing Legends Main Event? I am not. I just told you all everything I'm playing. Happy anniversary, Austin You. I am playing, uh, it says you're my anniversary follower. I'm not sure what that means. And Louis Philippe is my top fan. Sweet, everyone's here. We have a milestone follower. I wish I knew what these things meant. <laughs> um, anyway, no, I'm not going to the bike. It's too far away. Um, and for the, someone asked earlier for Borgata, I'm going to play the last flight of the almighty $400 tournament. I'm also going there with one of my friends from New York. He wanted to go play the $400 tournament. Like, oh, sure, we'll go splash the $400 tournament the day before. I think it's a $1,500 or something. What's my opinion of online America, poker in America compared to outside of America? Outside of America is legitimate and not so shady. Cash games are all GTO freaks, especially online. I mean, online, everybody plays pretty well. Um, but live, it's still very, very soft. I'm telling you all, this 2-5 game was super soft. I won $200 in about an hour and a half. Didn't do anything fancy. Raised continuation bet. Stole some pots every once in a while. I say nothing fancy. Like, I don't view the Jack-7 suited raised from out of position as anything fancy. That said, some of you all may think that that is fancy. But to me, that's just a good, fundamentally sound poker. You see people limping a ton. And you know the Rangers are weak, so blast them. Blast them, they're gonna fold, you win 30 bucks. Okay, so they were limping too much, um, resulting in them paying more rakes. Also, a lot of them had very awful mannerisms, like bets, bet timing tells, bet mannerisms. Um, this is not from the cash game, but in the main event, I had this hand. I had just rebought, and um, we're playing 30 big blinds deep, okay? I, I raised a 2,500 on the button, king jack offsuit, king of hearts jack clubs, big blind calls, young kid flop comes ace ten seven okay he basically instantly checks instant check the flop here doesn't mean a whole lot i bet 2500 he instantly called okay here first very important thing when people instantly check call the flop they usually have a very good made hand well a mark like a decent made hand like ace a sex here top pair or they have a lot of draws okay fine Turns of four diamonds, ace, ten, four, ace, ten, seven, four, two diamonds, two clubs, it goes check, check. River is a three of diamonds, and he instantly bet 5,500. 
Okay, so now he's done two things. He instantly called the turn, which I think means a draw or a marginal made hand. And then he instantly bet the river, which I think means a bluff or the effect of nuts. Think about how those two overlap. The only thing that overlaps here are the draws, right? So if we only have draws, and I'm sitting here with king high on the river, do I beat all the draws on ace, 10, seven, four, three? Maybe I misspoke there. He instantly bet the river. So he check, call, flop, check, check, turn, instantly bet the river. In that scenario, I think his range is like heavily weighted towards draws. And so I just called and uh, showed the king high, it was good. He had nine, eight for open into straight draw. And we won a nice little pot. And everyone at the table was like, wow. <laughs> but like in reality, to me, this person had horrible, horrible bet sizing, or bet timing tells. Timing tells, right? And a lot of people have these issues. Um, there's another spot in the cash game where I had kings. And um, my opponent like instantly called flop, instantly called turn, and then I got to the river and I bet the river. And uh, I thought he either had a draw, which I didn't think he would bluff all that often, or a pair that he would probably call with, but he folded, he had a draw. Um, someone mentioned earlier that people drastically under bluff in, in cash games, like live cash games, and I completely agree with this, right? Like right there, say the opponent has a busted draw and I check the river, high stakes players are betting that every time. And I would have definitely checked pocket kings in a high stakes game on the river, because if I bet, they may fold some worse, val worse made hands, like good made hands, but worse. But if I check, they may value bet like ace queen or king queen or queen jack on queen xxxx. And they may also bluff. So it's very important to know who you are against. What's my strategy against super loose gamblers? Play good cards with them. Get in there, mix it up, and go from there. Also, by the way, you need to get in there, you need to mix it up. A lot of people, well, there were two guys in this cash game I played the other day who just didn't put a chip in the pot. And when they did, they blasted it and everybody folded. And I'm like, what are you doing? You're never going to get action here, right? And they didn't get any action. And you need to be in there playing some pots. Now, I'm not saying play tons of pots. I was probably in the middle in terms of uh, the pots that I played, in terms of like the number, the percentage. Um, but I think you do want to be at least reasonably active. And if you just follow the, the range charts at pokercoaching.com, they're there, they're completely free. Just go get the range charts in the tool section. Um, if you just follow that, you will play a decent amount of hands, right? You won't be the nit, you won't be the maniac. Can you please explain to you what plus EV means? When he was going through a hand with pile solver with your friend, it was a single raise pop where you were the pre-flop raiser and the flop came, whatever, then a king came on the flop. He said that my EV goes up a lot on this turn. Essentially what he means in this scenario, your, your, your question is a bit of a mess. Anyway, say the flop, say you raise pre-flop, opponent calls out of position, the flop comes blank, 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 they check, you bet, or it goes check, check, either one. There, you should be betting with a lot of king highs, right? So whenever you they check, you bet, and they call, and the turn's a king, the king nails your flop betting range. So your equity, your the, the odd, the, the percentage of the pot that you own goes up. And I agree with, with Neva here. If you're playing with P.O. Solver and you don't know what EV means, WTF, uh, yeah, you need to go back, study the basics, read, ma uh, here's the book for you. Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em. This is definitely the book you need to get. It is a, pre it is a prerequisite to using Pio Solver. If you've never used, if you never read a book about basic terms, math, etc., this is the book for you. We discuss it right in the beginning. EV, ranges, etc., etc. What is ICM? Individual Chip Model. ICM. <laughs> What's the best on honest online poker site? I like Party Poker and Poker Stars. They seem to have very good checks in place. Um, Party Poker just got rid of hand histories for players to try to get rid of the heads up displays. That's how you get rid of the heads up displays is get rid of, getting rid of hand histories. I hope they figure out a way to make the hand histories available after the fact in some way that you can't plug them into heads up displays, but it is important for the players to be able to look at the game and audit the game. I mean, like this is how people found out the ultimate bet cheating scandal is happening. So I get the idea of not letting people use heads up displays, which is fine. I have no problem with that, but you do want to make sure that the players can audit the game if they feel inclined. 
Under what circumstances do you consider a player selling pieces of their action at a high markup to be unethical or a scam? I don't think it's ever a scam, honestly. That's just me being a capitalist, though. I think that if you have an item to sell, you can sell it for whatever price you want. Good example of this. Ah, we'll, we'll sell a World, World Poker Tour bracelet. Here I have a World Poker Tour bracelet. There are not very many of these in existence. There's a World Poker Tour bracelet here. There's a diamond in it. World Poker Tour bracelet here. Diamond in it. Says on the back, Foxwoods World Poker Finals 2008. Says it on the back, right? This is clearly a one-of-a-kind thing. This is an item. All right, what is the actual value of this thing? I don't know, 50 bucks, 100 bucks, something like that. If I put this on eBay and sell it, and I bank the starting price, $10,000, and somebody buys it, is that a scam? What do you think? Take a second. Is that a scam? I don't think it's a scam. I think that's perfectly fine and acceptable. And if somebody wants to buy it, great. And if somebody doesn't want to buy it, that's fine. I'll keep it because I don't want to sell it at 9999 I want to sell it for 10000 right? Even though it's only worth 100 It has value to me. Now, backing is a little bit different in that you are selling almost like an equity, right? Imagine I have a stock of the Disney company. I don't know what it's worth. Let's call it $100, right? But I find somebody wants to give me, that's willing to give me $200 for it, even though they could buy it elsewhere for um, $100. Is that a scam? And I don't think so. Again, you are essentially just being the middleman, right? And very often, like you see this in cryptocurrency all the time, a lot of people ha don't actually have um, access to trading, right? So you have to go through a middleman. And if you have to go through a middleman, the middleman takes a VIG. Is taking a VIG a scam? And the answer is no. They're providing you a service of trading your whatever US dollars to Bitcoin or your Bitcoin to Decred or whatever. So that's a value and um, you pay for the service. In terms of selling my action at a high markup, no, with me knowing that I think it's overpriced, is that a scam? And the answer is still no in my mind. Say I want to sell a tournament tomorrow that I think I'm going to have 50% ROI in for 1.8. Because I know people want Jonathan Little action, right? There's only so much to go around. You can only get it through me. If you want you want to sweat, it's probably not a great sweat. You're probably going to lose money. But you get to have a piece of Jonathan Little, which a lot of people enjoy and appreciate, then you don't have to buy it. That's really the thing is you don't have to buy it. Now, you may say, shouldn't we protect the buyers and make sure that they are given a fair shake? And I don't really think so. I think it's sort of like buyer beware on a lot of these things. Um, that said, I, I'm a really big fan of what Daniel Negreanu did this summer where he just sold some action at break even. I, I think that's a great thing. And uh, you can be sure Jonathan Little's gonna do that next World Series. But we're just gonna sell 10% of my action or something like that at no markup. And you can only buy like $20 worth or something, you know? So that a lot of people get to have a sweat with no markup, genius idea. A lot of a lot of a headache <laughs> on my end. Yeah, a little piece of little. That's not a good idea. Um, but yeah, so that's fine, right? I, I don't really have a problem with that. It's the buyer's responsibility to do research. Yeah, the problem is is that like where do, where is the line? And I don't know. I don't know where the line is. Maybe there's just not one. I don't know. Clearly, though, like you see Bernie Madoff going to jail for running a Ponzi scheme, right? Just a straight up scam. And is that, like, should, should you go to jail for actually defrauding people? Like, what is defrauding people? And I don't know. I don't know what defrauding people is. I'm not a lawyer. So, is it, the, the thing is with the markup, you can basically say, I think my edge is whatever I think my edge is, right? And it's hard to actually know, right? Anyway, we'll get off that topic. Let's see. Yeah, I had a piece of Dale Negron who's action. I had the $5,000 package, the most profitable one. It was actually funny, right at the end of the series, the series was kind of going poorly for me. And I had a decent cash at the end. Negron who won, won a tournament right at the end, got me up. It's always nice. Can you make a living grinding three, five, and five, ten? Absolutely. You can make. If you're a good player and you put in a lot of time, you can easily make $20,000, $30,000 a month playing 510. It's pretty decent living.
Right, like here, here's a good question. What about bankers selling a worthless stock, worthless stock to people who have no clue about the stock market? Is that a scam or not? Like, I don't know. I don't know. What if it's not worthless, but they're just selling to people who don't know anything? You know, in um, Angel Investing, there's a good book on this. It's called Angel by my friend Jason Calacanis. If you all love investing, et cetera, et cetera, check it out. Good, solid book. Um, there is no protection for the buyer. You, whenever, and, and the fun thing is that when you buy a piece of a startup company, it will fail very often, and you know this. It is high-risk investment in exchange for potentially higher rewards if you get it right. And like I'm cool with that. I don't have a problem. I do my research, and I also have other people do research for me, like Jason Calacanis. I invest with him in a syndicate, and I trust him to do great work. I trust myself to do at least okay work, and, um, and that's it. Amy Broder joined. Good morning. We're going to pretend like you're on a coffee break. Let's see. All right, all right. Back to cash games. What are some more cash game tips? Um, always pay attention to bet sizes as well. Very often in this game that I played, the 2-5 game yesterday, People would bet small with their marginal hands and big with their good hands across the board every time. Which, you know, actually isn't all that bad in terms of fundamental poker strategies, assuming both ranges are well protected. We discuss how to protect your ranges thoroughly at pokercoaching.com in the homework challenges. And if your ranges are not well protected, what happens is when you bet small, you just fold and you get raised every time. And we actually discussed this exact thing um, the other day in a in an inner circle webinar where we discussed this exact trait where someone would bet small on the river and you just blast them, you just raise huge. And they would fold every time. Because in their mind, I'm gonna bet small. If they call me, great, probably the best hand. If they raise me, I'm probably dead. But if you're playing against smart players when they raise you, they're actually gonna have the bet, they're gonna have a bluff a lot of the time. And my students have been cleaning up with this play. Where do backers for cash games come from? Do they generally approach players? I don't know. I don't do much cash game backing at all, or effectively no cash game backing, um, because it's really easy to steal from people, right? I mean, imagine how easy it is. You're playing 2-5, and every day you just put $100 in your pocket. Like, <laughs> I, I generally trust people to do the right thing, but I really don't want it to be super easy for someone to get me. I mean, like, an, an easier way to, to perhaps do that is to be at the same table with a person because then you can actually watch what they're doing. But then you have the issue of, um, you have the issue of, like, being at the same table with playing on the same bankroll or whatever, which is also a bit shady. It's not, not necessarily shady. It is what it is. Um, you get know what I'm saying, though. Anytime, you, like, Jonathan Little has pieces of me and somebody else at the table, it gets to be a little bit dicey. But um, you want to make sure Whenever you are putting money out on the street, you want to make sure you have a very good chance of getting it back without losing loss of it to random things. And in tournaments, people are going to have a way more difficult time stealing from you because as a backer, you can request, request receipts. And also there's a public record of wins and losses, right? So you may say, well, I trust the person. Yeah, well, trust will get you sometimes. I mean, I got very lucky a long time ago. I had a friend who I played Magic the Gathering with, and we he played a little bit of poker. I was going to buy him a cheap computer, a three or five hundred dollar computer, something like that. Give him three hundred dollars to play sit and goes, play ten dollars sit and goes, and I was going to teach him to play, and then I was going to keep half of his profits. Seems like a great deal, right? Great deal for him. He has nothing going on in life, and um, I'm going to teach him to play poker and develop a skill because back then I was winning tons of money. And I bought him the computer, sent him three hundred dollars, and then he moved to Texas, and I never heard from him again. And that was a good lesson. Cost me a few $500,000, something like that, out the door. And I learned that, you know, you can be friends with people. Well, friends, friends. You can be friends with people. But if you make it easy for people to really get you, they, even if they don't necessarily even think they're going to, sometimes it happens. And you want to avoid putting yourself at risk for no real reason. So um, be aware of that. You love my devotion and desire to improve poker in general. Thank you. I appreciate that. How do you just the old timers who limp? Uh -oh, what's happening on Instagram? How do you just the old timers who limp with aces and kings? 
don't raise their limps as often. Come on, Instagram. I am so old, I don't know how to work Instagram. They limp with aces and kings 100% of the time and never three bet or lead. You just keep checking down. Well, no, realize they don't have aces or kings all the time, right? Imagine their range is aces, kings, ace 10, ace 9, ace 8, ace 7, ace 6, ace 5, ace 4, ace 3, king, jack, king 10, king 9, king 8, etc., 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 right? If they have the nuts 5% of the time and the junk or marginal stuff 95% of the time, it doesn't really matter all that much that they happen to have the aces. Let's see. People make 30K a year at a regular nine to five. 30K a month is balling. Indeed, 30K a month is balling. That's the goal. You have six big blind over 100 and one two online. On an American site, is that good? Yeah, it's probably fine. It's probably solid, right? If you're winning, winning is good. When playing live, would you rather inflate the pot with big hands preflop to 6x or 10x or play them like an online game for 2 or 2.5? We discussed this earlier. You want to use bigger raise sizes across the board because the rake is higher in live poker. That said, I was still opening to 15 at the 2-5 game I played. I think 20 is probably optimal. I was really just trying to get some hands in, so uh, that was good. What's the best way to build a bankroll from poker? It's very easy to build a bankroll from poker. You just have to find a game you can beat and play with it a ton. Let's see, there's a difference between a friend and somebody you just know. What's up? Are you my friend? Yeah. I don't know, I may just know you. You want to say hello to everybody today? Hello. What are you doing today? We're going to gym class. You're going to the gym class? Mm -hmm. Are you going to lift some weights? Mm -hmm. Are you going to dance? Yeah. Are you going to go through a tube? No. No, are you going to swing? No. All right, I better let you go. Say bye-bye. Bye. Say have a good day. Good luck. Good day. Oh, what are you going to get at Starbucks? A croissant. A croissant? Yeah. Oh, you have a croissant. That's nice. What's Grandpa going to get? A croissant I get. Yeah, what's he going to get from Starbucks? Huh? What's he going to get? A croissant. A cappuccino? A cappuccino. A cappuccino, yeah. And you're going to have, what are you going to get? Hmm? What are you going to get from Starbucks? A croissant. A croissant. Yeah. All right, have a good day. Good day. See ya. Have a good day. Bye. Love you. Have fun. Bye. Um, let's see. They're going to teach your kids to play poker. I'm going to teach my kids to play all sorts of poker. All sorts of games in general. But yeah, there's the idea that, like, what is a friend? And I have friends who I, I certainly, like, we, trade, we uh, trade money back and forth. We loan money back and forth. It's a group of, like you said, seven people. And, um... Even then, if they said, hey, I need 100K to do something, I'm like, uh, no. <laughs> right? Since it's $500 deep, you're playing smaller pots, etc. The problem with smaller pots, again, is the rake. The rake will absolutely kill you. Who's the best player you've ever played at at the poker table? I don't know. It's a weird question. James is two years, seven months old. What does the best player mean, right? In theory, like, who's the biggest winner? And I don't know. The biggest winner is not necessarily the best player. How does $300 max bet affect 3.5? Not much because you're only buying in for 500, right? Yeah, so Aus Poker Club, 10% $15 cap at 2.5 means you want to play almost no hands and win all of them. That rake is brutal. Um, probably unbeatable, nearly unbeatable. Playing small pots will actually absolutely crush you. Let's see, you're going to have a second baby any day. Good luck, have fun. Isn't 30K a year like minimum wage? Um, we were saying you can make 30000 a month, so 12 times minimum wage. 10 years ago, were the games softer or harder? They were way softer. Games get tougher over time. That said, cash games typically get, um, or live, live games get tougher at a slower rate just because people have a, they don't see as many hands, they don't see as many iterations of the game, so therefore they improve slower. Do you play much Scoop or W Coop? No, I don't think there's much of an edge to be had. I own a piece of uh, Pokar Backing Co the Pokar Backing Company, and they have lots of data to say that the highest stakes tournaments are not all that beatable. Because everybody's good. If everybody's good, it is what it is, right? Don't have ego and think that you have to play the biggest games just because they exist. Just because a game exists doesn't mean you have to play it. Do 
Do recreational players need a bankroll when they're playing recreationally? Depends on how you're approaching poker, right? Like, if you don't care about winning or losing, then um, you know, do whatever you want. If you're trying to treat the game professionally, then um, you should probably treat the game professionally. If you're using my charts, you can just delete the earlier positions. Yeah, low jack and later. Easy game. We actually have implementable GTO charts coming out for six-handed poker in the very near future, so check that out. We're going to be talking about that tonight, actually, in my webinar. Um, it's completely free. You can go to twitter.com slash Jonathan Little. 8 p.m. tonight, we'll be going through five cash game tips. It'll help you get way, way, way better at poker. He sounds like a really old man, Italian man saying cappuccino. <laughs> yeah. And croissant. Let's see. Is it negative EV to three, to three bet to five times the out from out of position with an over pair of playing against a deep stacked opponent? No, it's probably fine. It depends on the scenario, right? I don't know. It depends on the spot. What is James' birthday? 12 24, 2016. Is it good to use pot control players who aren't folding often before the flop? Uh, no, you want to be value betting against players who are playing, um, you want to be value betting against players who play way too many hands because their ranges are so wide the way you beat these players is by value betting them a lot and you know to be fair bluffing a lot would you say the best thing to do is playing more tournaments no i think the best thing to do to get good at poker is to play live cash games and crush the very bad players in the game that is still the softest live cash games are definitely the softest form of poker you're going to find for the most part how'd you become friends with shannon shore he was playing sit and goes on party poker with me we were playing the same games and um, he would berate the fish every once in a while when he lost, because we were all young, dumb kids. Everybody goes through this phase, or at least a lot of people do, where they berate the fish when they lose, which is stupid. And uh, he was being stupid. I already went through that phase. Somebody taught me to not berate the fish. And so I taught him to not berate the fish. Then um, he won a tournament seat to Austria to play a tournament there. And I said, hey, I'll tag along. So we tagged along, hung out, roomed together for many years. He was the best man at my wedding. And uh, yes, he is in my circle of seven friends who, if he needed a pile of money, I would uh, reluctantly say okay. But uh, yeah, I, I do not expect Shane and Shore to run off, with any money, run off with any of my money. He's one of the few people I happily keep an open tab with, one way or the other. What's my favorite board game? I wish I got to play board games. Don't have enough time. What do you think is a new cash out option on Poker Stars? I don't even know what that means. Is it okay to not tip every hand at 1 3? Sure. What are my thoughts on flop bets after three betting pre-flop? Small flop bets. Small flop bets are great. You should be betting small, especially on boards that are very uncoordinated. We discussed this thoroughly in Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em. Why do you say play more live games? In live poker, the games are just softer. You can play way bigger stakes against softer opponents, right? And like, what do you want in poker? I mean, you either are playing to win money, which you want to play high stakes against bad players, or you're playing to get experience, in which case you want to play tough games online, presumably, where you can get in a lot of hands, right? So, depends on what you're trying to accomplish. But if you're trying to grow a bankroll and get a pile of money, the easiest way to do that is to just play one, two, learn to win $20 an hour, move to two, five, make $50 an hour, move to five, 10, make $100 an hour. There you go, there's your 30K a month, you're set. What determines your mindset to when getting up when having a winning session? I don't care if I'm having a winning or losing session. Um, poker is one long session and that's how you have to view the game like the last hand of this session is just the first hand of the next session it doesn't matter a lot of people like to say oh I quit a winner because in their mind if you're not a winner you're a loser and being a loser is bad but winning and losing don't actually matter all that much what matters is are you winning equity which is often not reflected in your stack let's see very difficult for people coming to pokercoaching.com to get through all of the material there. That's true. That's why you don't have to go through everything there. Go through exactly what you need. Go through the spots that you find interesting or difficult, right? You have to understand that whenever someone develops a large curriculum, like we have at pokercoaching.com, I'm not saying, here, go through this and do all of it. Because like you say, it'll take you 260 days to get through it. And um, that's okay, right? What's wrong with having tons of content to get through? Poker's not supposed to be easy. I'm not presenting a six hour course and say this is all you need to win at poker i know a lot of my competitors do that and that's not really how to go about actually teaching to people to win at poker 
You have to get in there and you have to work. You have to do the homework, right? You have to do the quizzes. You have to test yourself and continuously test yourself. And if you just think you're going to watch six hours of videos and become a world-class player, hate to break it to you, uh, you're delusional. And that's how a lot of other content creators try to promote what they do because, like, honestly, they just don't want to do the work themselves. They don't actually want to put forth all of the work on a regular basis to teach you to get better at poker. I mean, we produce lots and lots of content on a very consistent basis because that is what it actually takes to get good at playing cards. You need to practice a lot. And you say there's 260 days of practice for there, there for you to catch up, like that's a bad thing. Well, I don't think it's a bad thing, I think that's great. I want there to be a thousand days worth of work for there for you to do. All right, all right, all right. Is it ever appropriate to consider the high hand bad beat jackpot? Pretty much no. In limit hold'em maybe, but not in no limit. Everyone asking about rake. Go to um, jonathanlittlepoker.com slash bankroll. The rake is actually relevant. Imagine they took $100 per hand at 2.5. They just took $100 out of the pot. Can you beat that game? Think about it, right? The answer is it depends on how bad the opponents are. What if the opponents, what if every hand is all in, 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 and it's on you? and you get to decide to call or fold, and the pot's gonna be seven all-in stacks, you could certainly beat that game, right? But your opponents have to be really, 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 really bad. So you have to ask, what is going on at the table? It's not as easy as, can you beat this? Or what bankroll should I have? Or what should I buy in for? Like all these questions, they don't matter. There are more parameters and more metrics that you need to consider than just that simple question. What return on investment are multi-table tournaments regulars making with buy-ins from 255 to 215? I suppose you mean online? I don't know, 20, 30%, something like that? 40%, 50%? It's difficult to say. All right, let's see. How do you handle overbets on the turn? Defendant minimum defense frequency, maybe a little bit more or less depending on the opponent's strategy. All right, I have to get going. Is it just playing the game that keeps you hungry for success? I love learning games and studying games. Um, kind of like Michael Acevedo, who just wrote Modern Poker Theory, it's a new book behind me. He loves studying the game and finding the optimal strategy. And I love that too. And all games, I don't actually enjoy the process of playing so much, but I enjoy the process of beating the game, solving the game, right? Because then, once you know how to beat the game, you show up and do it and print your money and print your win rate, right? And that's really what I enjoy, more so than the actual sitting down and playing. Because I, I recognize that a lot of people play poker as a way to pass time, as a way to go do something that challenges them. But to me, the most challenging thing is to figure out the actual right strategy, as opposed to trying to figure out how to play my specific hand on the fly in this generic situation. Isn't minimum defense frequency not really a thing because people don't bluff often enough? It depends on the opponent's strategy, swine. We discussed this already, right? If the opponent's bluffing too much, you need to defend it more than minimum defense frequency. So you're saying maybe the people in your games don't bluff enough. Players in high stakes games over bluff. You wanna know why? Because people don't call enough. So that means you need to call way more than normal. Way, way, way more than normal. If you're playing tournaments, 100 to 300 player field sizes, can you use 100 to 150 buy-in? Jeff, go to jonathanlittlepoker.com slash bankroll. That's very clearly said there. There's a way other than Twitter for to register for tonight's webinar. If you go, if you're on my email list, I sent you an email about it. If you're not on my email list and you're not on Twitter, get your act together. Get on one of the two. But yeah, anyway, it's the very first post on twitter.com slash jonathanlittle. It'll come right up. I don't even think you have to be logged in. Just click it and click the link and you'll go right to go to webinar. Uh, let's see. I definitely disagree with what Natty says here. You say that poker's a game of betting and raising if you're checking and calling, good luck. Well, the easiest way to beat overly aggressive players is to do a whole lot of checking and calling. Like in the high stakes games, right, we just discussed, if people are over bluffing, you don't wanna be raising, because when you raise, it forces them to play straightforwardly, whereas when you call, you keep them in with all of their bluffs. And if you keep them in with all their bluffs and they're gonna keep bluffing with them, you're just gonna print money by checking and calling. It's okay to check and call, it's absolutely okay. You want this shirt? Well, um, I only have three of them. If I ever get more made, I will let all of you know. These shirts, unfortunately, cost like $100 each, and I'll make them for myself because I'm going to be out there playing poker in them, but uh, that's expensive to send $100 shirts to people. Maybe we'll find a better way to, to get them made. So anyway, that's me for today. Again, we have a webinar tonight at twitter.com slash Jonathan Little. 
where will today's webinar be? It'll be on GoToWebinar. You have to um, go sign up at the link. If you don't go to the sign up at the link, you're not going to get in. So that's going to be tonight, 8 p.m. We'll be discussing five cash game tips that you must master to succeed at cash games. If you miss it, the replay will be on YouTube, I'm sure. Gunter saying, what steak is best for the beginning player? The smallest. Have a great day. Enjoy yourselves. Be nice to someone. And I will see you again on Wednesday.